Good morning. morning. Welcome to First Parish Congregational Church. Uh, There is a chance for our church to feed the hungry tomorrow, Monday, at Bon Appetit at Second Parish Congregational Church in Biddeford at 4.30. If you would like to be a part of this, you can sign up in the uh, atrium on the sign-up sheet near the office. Thank you. Good morning, First Parish. I'm Brenda McDonald. Um, I'm wearing two hats this morning. One is a Stephen leader, and the other is a member of the prayer group. You probably already found two cards on your pew, and that would be cards. Sorry, my main accent got in the way. Uh, You're perhaps even sitting on them. The Stephen ministry cards are free for the taking. You perhaps know of someone who could use some caring support, or perhaps you yourself need someone who can carefully listen, pray for and with you, uh, help deal with feelings, and maintain confidentiality all at the same time. Take one of the cards for yourself or a friend. Reverend Deborah or myself will be happy to talk with you more about this. Uh, You can see us after church or call the church office. The purple caring cards are provided on the second Sunday of every month for use by members of the congregation to send messages, a word of congratulations, get well, thanks, to others in our church family. Just write the person's name on the card and put it in the offering plate for the prayer group to address and mail. Or you may prefer to take the card yourself Thank you for helping to spread God's care and love by participating in this simple ministry. Good morning. My name is Dolly Ann Agnostis and I am the chair of the stewardship team. First, I have a huge thank you to the 42 pledging units that have already turned in their pledges. Thank you so much, that's really, really great. Based on last year's pledging units and pledged giving, we are exactly one-third of the way there there in both pledging units and dollars. This is a wonderful thing, so thank you all. If you have not passed in your pledge cards, please do so this week or bring them a week from today on Consecration Sunday. The service will be followed by our annual egg bake and... At that egg bake, we will announce the winners of our T-I-Y-P-A-W contest. If you can figure out what that acronym means, see Jane Campbell after church out in Fellowship Hall. She'll have a big metal bucket on her head and you can drop in what that acronym means. And we will have a gift certificate to Starbucks for those people that are actually able to tell us what it means. Please do pledge to help us meet our goal of 100% of all members pledging, even if your finances are unsure. Pledge a smaller amount, but pledge something. There are pledge cards in the parlor, in the bright green stewardship binders, outside the office door in the slot marked stewardship, at the table and with the ushers and diaconate at the back of the sanctuary. And for those of you that just like to eat, they'll be on the serving table at coffee hour. Thank you. (laughs) Lots of announcements this morning. What a busy place we live in. I am truly amazed. This week, the Progresso Pyramid Challenge, A through M, 102 cans of soup. And N through Z, 77. That's almost 200 cans of soup in two weeks for this place. This is absolutely amazing. What a giving and warm community we live in. So we have two more weeks to do this. So when you're out at the market basket or Shaw's or Hannaford, throw a couple extra cans in your shopping cart and bring them on in. And next week we'll see maybe N through Z will beat the A through M's. Who knows? Hey there, I'm Heather. 
I'm the, um, what am I, vice moderator? Um, yeah, that's what I am. Um, our interim minister is on a planned um, educational retreat today. So um, it's my pleasure to welcome the Reverend Cindy Maybeck once again to First Parish. Uh, Cindy established Spirit Story Ministry in which she tells biblical stories by heart to bring scripture alive to transform the church and those who hear the words spoken through her. Um, she tells powerful stories. If you've heard it before, you know that. Her joy is contagious. When you meet her, you just feel happier. Uh, her faith is sincere and her hope in God is truly inspiring. She preaches all over New England and we are lucky to have her here today. So please join me in welcoming Cindy. Thank you, Heather. It's a delight to be with you this morning. Uh, welcome to First Parish, a place where you are home, a place where you may be beloved, a place where maybe whatever faith you have might grow just a little bit, a place where there is song and prayer and community and an opportunity to work together to help make this world shine a little brighter. Welcome, welcome, so glad you're here. There are pew pads and you can write your names down and pass those along and have the opportunity to see who it is who is gathered around you. And at this time, uh, we will continue to worship in music. I invite you to stand and join in the call to worship, which is found printed in your bulletin. The Lord is continually creating something new. Through all this change, God is with us. Praise be to God who continually blesses us.
please join me in the prayer of invocation found in your bulletin. In the midst of continual change, God remains steadfast in God's love for us. God is creating something new, a new heaven and a new earth. Each day offers newness of hope and faith. Let us open our hearts and spirits to God's creative word, that we may learn, grow, and serve as effective witnesses to God's love and power. Children, please come forward. We've got all the singing children forward, but let's get everybody forward. Hi, you guys. I'm Reverend Cindy. Can I sit down with you instead of standing in front of you? Can you guys make space? Oh, you are awesome. Can you see me over there? I'm Reverend Cindy, and I am preaching just for today. Come on over. Hi. I'm so glad to see you guys. So do you, do you know that we had an election? Did you know that? Yeah. So I wanted to tell you about a, an election when I was in sixth grade. Do we have any sixth graders here? Yeah? Fifth graders? Fourth graders? OK. Well, I was in sixth grade. My brother was in fourth grade. And I wanted Senator McGovern to be the president. And so did most of my friends. Now, I know this is hard for you to imagine, but we did not have cell phones when I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. We could not text. 
We could not be on Facebook or Instagram. There was no Twitter. There was hardly anything except our voices. So when we were, I'm going to stand up so you guys can see me. So when we were kids, the way we made, we had two things we could do. We could draw. So we drew big pictures because I wanted Senator McGovern. And we would put McGovern on the school bus window. And then our school bus matron said we couldn't do that. So there's only one thing left to do. You know what we did? We screamed. <laughs> I'll show you how, but I have to preach later, and it'll make me lose my voice. We came home after the school bus, and we'd say, hi, Mom. And she'd say, what's wrong? I was yelling for McGovern. So everybody on the bus yelled for McGovern except Alan and John. They yelled for Nixon. And what I remember is one day as we came close to the election, we were all screaming, McGovern! And Alan and John were standing in the back, and Alan screamed Nixon so loud. He had red, uh, uh, Alan had red hair and freckles. He screamed so loud, his face turned as red as a tomato. I thought he was going to fall over. He was screaming Nixon so loud. It was louder than everybody. Well, apparently, the kid who screams loudest wins. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought the most kids on the bus win. No, <laughs> President Nixon won the election. I was so disappointed. I was so disappointed. So I finished my breakfast, and as a kid, I hate mornings. Do any of you like to sleep in instead of go to school? Yeah, that was me. But I, I wasn't allowed to, I had to get up, so here's me on the bus. So I didn't care who won. But on the ride home, I was awake. And I got on the bus, and do you know there were no seats except a seat next to Alan? So I went over and I sat down next to Alan. And you know what he did? He punched me in the arm. And in those days, a boy only punched a girl in the arm who he liked. <laughs> it was his way of saying, you're my friend. And you know what I did? I punched it, but really gently, just gave him a little tap back. And then, we started talking about the kickball game that we were going to play later. And you know, on Facebook, we have Facebook now. I actually friended Alan just a little while ago. Yep, he's still my friend, even though I like McGovern and he liked Nixon. <laughs> so here's the thing. I know about presidential elections. We do a lot of screaming on buses or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever. But after the election, that's time to be friends again. And I was so pleased to see President Obama welcome Mr. Trump into the White House. And I thought, there's not many nations in the world where there's such an easy transfer of power. That's part of being in United States democracy. We have arguments and disagreements, but then we welcome people we disagree with. And that's the great thing about Jesus. You thought I'd talk about Jesus, right? Because I'm a minister. <laughs> He loved it when people who disagreed were his friends. You know his 12 disciples? Some were Democrats, some were Republicans. <laughs> In ancient Israelite kind of ways. And they all loved Jesus. And they were all friends, even when they disagreed. So I encourage you to be nice to kids who think differently than you do about politics. And be nice to kids who go to different churches than you do. And be nice to kids who are your friends, and be nice to kids who might not be your friends, because that's what Jesus taught us to do. Right? Do you want to punch me right here, just really gently? Yeah, right. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for friendship, and we thank you for Jesus, who taught us to be friends with everybody, no matter how they vote. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with our children's story. You kids can go to Sunday school class now, I believe. Good to meet you all.
Chapter 12 of Isaiah, the first of the prophetical books in the Old Testament, found on page 882 of your Pew Bible. <coughs> Isaiah, who may have been a priest, proclaimed his messages in Judah and Jerusalem 
from 742 to about 701 BC, during that critical period when the Northern Kingdom was annexed to the Assyrian Empire, an uneasy time. Chapter 12 closes a section given to Isaiah's memoirs. It holds two songs, a song of deliverance and a song of thanksgiving. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Children give so generously. The second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses um, 9 through, what am I doing for you guys, 5 through 19. I invite you not to look along in your text, but to put your attention here that I might tell the word as it was first heard told from person to person in the early church. The Gospel of Luke 21, verses 5 through 19. It goes like this. When some people were speaking about the temple and how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, you see all these things around you. The days are coming when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. And they said, teacher, uh, when will this happen? And uh, uh, what is the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, beware that you are not led astray because many will come in my name and say, I am he and the end is near. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified because all these things must take place first. But the end will not immediately follow. Then he said to them, nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes. In some places, there will be famines and plagues. There will be dreadful portents and great signs from the heavens. But before all this occurs before all this. They will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and governors for the sake of my name. This will give you the opportunity to testify. So make up your mind not to prepare your defense ahead of time, because I will give you the words 
and a wisdom that those who oppose you, your opponents, they will not be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death. All of you will be hated because of my name. But not a hair on your head shall perish. And because of your endurance, you will gain your souls. Here ends the telling of God's blessed word. Thanks be to God. spirit of prayer. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. May I just say what a delight it is to be here with you. Uh, when we don't live in Worcester, we're at Ocean Park and First Parish is amongst my favorite churches, so I have this sense of being home. Uh, home away from home, and I just really am grateful for your welcome, uh, for the vastness of your ministry, for your courage, for your faithfulness, for your leadership. Um, thank you. So the scripture that I told you, the setting is this in Luke. What has just happened is that Jesus and his disciples are in the temple, and the widow brought her might, <laughs> like the kids, right? It was all she had was this little dollar, all she had. So Jesus points this out to his disciples. He says it's not that she gave out of her abundance, but out of her scarcity. And surely he, on this last part of their journey to Jerusalem, he's already preparing himself to sacrifice his life, all that he has, giving all that he has, all that he is, for our sake. And so he's moved by this widow giving all that she has for the sake of faith. And perhaps even before he gets a chance to take a breath after this comment, there are some people saying, oh my, look at that beautiful sanctuary. Like tourists, you know. And Jesus tells his disciples, that the days are coming when the temple will fall. And in his day, no one could imagine it. It actually happened in the year 70 of the Common Era. The temple was destroyed. But in the time of Jesus and his disciples, nobody could imagine it. And I, I try to think, because we, we look at the text with this kind of historical uh, uh, Precedence, and, and so we know what's going to happen. I'm like, so what would it be like if we were in the position of those disciples, of, of him speaking of something so precious, we can't even imagine it falling. What would it be if Jesus said to us, the days are surely coming when democracy will fall. The days are surely coming when Wall Street will fall. Not one stock will bear interest on another. What if he were walking alongside us on the beach? Do you go there sometimes when things are just too loud on the news and you just need a place to breathe? What if he were walking beside us and saying, the days are surely coming when the floods will make it so there is not one grain of sand upon another. Can you imagine how afraid the disciples would have been when we put it in our own context, what 
what they think and say. So I don't really like apocalyptic scriptures. I'll be honest with you, I love coming here, but I did not like learning this text for you. <laughs> because those of you who are biblical storytellers know there's a way that it gets right inside those sinews and in between those cells and become part of you, and I don't like it. Except this week it seemed to fit. See, here's the thing about that apocalyptic kind of thinking. Not as a prescription, but sometimes it might work as a description. If we fear that our fear is too deep for anyone to understand, we just read in the text, there it is. You see, there is nothing, there is nothing that we cannot walk through that God has not prepared us to endure. There is no situation too terrible. There is no violence too awful. There is no surprise too horrific. There is nothing in earth or in heaven beyond the experience of God. And on a good day, I don't really like to think about that too much. But in times of trouble, I hold fast. That beautiful, beautiful text that Nancy Jo offered us that has that, that psalm of deliverance, God's anger, but then it goes away. And then after that first verse, there is comfort and love and comfort and love and comfort and comfort again. And Jesus teaching that by our endurance, we gain our souls. Do you hear that, church? All we have to do is endure it. That's all we have to do is to be awake and alive and present to all that is around us. And we will gain the gift of spiritual peace and wisdom and most of all, love. Jesus says, I love this part. I may not like apocalyptic literature, but I love this part. Jesus says, make up your mind not to prepare ahead of time. Whew. <laughs> right? Don't prepare ahead of time because Jesus says, I will give you words and wisdom. <sighs> and now how? How do we share the kind of love that Jesus teaches even as he is about to walk toward the cross even as he speaks to his disciples about the incredible violence to come to the early church, even as he predicts all of this difficulty, how do we live in love? So I barely remember how he did it before Facebook and social media, but we ministers are all over that page. And I need you to know a lot of my colleagues are very happy this was the gospel for today. And indeed, there are pastors all over the ecumenical circle of, uh, of churches in the United States, uh, some preaching this to blue churches, some preaching this to red churches. I'm in a lavender church. <laughs> oh, yeah, the open and affirming part, too. But how blessed you are to have in your midst parishioners who disagree politically, because that's the world. How blessed you are to be church in this crazy mixed up moment of time. You guys are in an entrance period, right? Yikes! Who knew how tumultuous that can be? It's all different. A pastor who retired, a music director who resigned, an interim minister who has entered, a music director who has entered. Harold, so great to have you with us this morning. Lay leaders needing to pick up leadership in a way and in a community that just seems a little different. And if that wasn't enough to get your church shaking, you turn on the news at night. <laughs> oh, man. I know, let's get away from the news. Let's look at Facebook. No better. 
I did. I posted on Facebook. I said, uh, what does lament sound like? Because I've been so rocked by the hatred on all sides that I hear. And my second favorite answer is lament sounds like this in the middle of it. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. And then David posted and he said, lament sounds like deep silence. And too many people think silence is like this. La, 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 right? I mean the kind of prayer by which we rest in the very depth of our hearts and souls and hold in love the people who agree with us and the people who disagree with us. Hold in love the people we see as colleagues and the people we see as enemies. Hold in love the people we hold close and the people we've not met yet. Hold in love those who are a part of our nation and those who are on the outside. Hold in love all in this depth. My friends, this is what we know how to do as Christians. This is the good news. We teach our children about love. And it's a countercultural kind of a movement because I see such divisiveness. Any media, you'll see divisiveness. And it's not as difficult as it was when I was a kid to just hang with our own. People think just like us. Here's the thing about Jesus. I know there weren't Democrats and Republicans. You see, the minister tells children's stories, and then the Sunday school teachers have to, like, correct what the minister said. There weren't Democrats and Republicans in Jesus' time. I know that. But think about his 12 disciples. Simon the Zealot. All that he wanted to do and all of his energy was in overthrowing Rome. And Matthew the tax collector, who got his paycheck from Rome, because he went around collecting ridiculously high taxes, 70% in those days, from people who had nothing. And somehow, Simon and Matthew were together at the table. Somehow, regular old fishermen were there with Levites. Somehow, an incredible diversity of followers Jesus gathered together in unity for the sake of love. Friends, this is our history. This is who we are. Do you have any idea how much the world needs your witness? And it doesn't even have to be a loud witness. Oh, good. <laughs> I mean, if you're called to a loud witness, go for it. There's a woman from my former church, her name is Donna, and she, uh, she was very, very faithful. She loved to usher. She ushered for decades. And she had a son who got mixed up in a pretty tough gang. And he moved to home while he was trying to put his life back together. And one night he had a bunch of his friends over. They were downstairs in the rec room. And Donna came downstairs with some um, ginger ale and, and chips and salsa and uh, t spoke with the young men for a while. And then she went back upstairs. And later that night, her son came to her and he said, Mom, I have to tell you something. And she said, what? He said. Thank you for being kind. Doesn't seem like much, does it? She's like, honey, what do you mean? He said, well, my friends commented on it. None of my friends had ever experienced kindness. Think about that. That there are young people in our world who don't know kindness. The social media is so snarky. It's funny, but it's mean. <laughs> and I don't mean to blame the social media. I'm just saying this is our way of communicating. And the way to be kind, which is to be spiritually present in love to another person regardless of agreements or disagreements, that is something you know that was given to you at your baptism, your confirmation. You know how to be kind because you follow Jesus. 
I won't pretend it isn't easy. And I look around for stories about how it is to step into a situation in which we disagree and to continue to be kind and loving. Every year there's a uh, minister's council meeting at the American Baptist Assembly in Green Lake, Wisconsin, and a couple of pastors, the cream of the cream, are chosen from each conference to go to this event. Back in 2005, there had been quite a bit of conflict. In 2004, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts made equal marriage possible, and so my uh, partner Elaine and I had a legal renewal of vows to make our commitment legal. And the American Baptist Evangelicals heard about that, and after a lot of back and forth and conflict, the compromise was that while I would not be allowed to chair the Professional Effectiveness Committee anymore, I would be allowed to represent Massachusetts at the national meeting. Oh boy. So I went. And sat in meeting after meeting that somebody else chaired, that somebody else ran, all of my ideas were lifted in someone else's voice. And I was present, fully present. And by the end of the third day, I noticed Scott, who noticed me. And he asked if he could speak with me. Now, Scott was from the West Virginia Conference, which is known for its evangelical stand against homosexuality. And he asked if we could speak. Now, there was a particular room set aside for such conversations. On the door, it said prayer room. The bright fluorescent lights were off, and instead there were floor lamps casting soft light. There was a small table with an Indian print cloth over it, and a wooden cross, and a candle uh, scented with a linen scent, and, and a Bible open to Psalm 46. And so we went in there and spoke as pastors do. Where did we go to seminary, and what was the church like, and what were some of the successes, and what were some of the frustrations, and how is it that God called each of us? And we talked and talked and talked, which pastors tend to do, until Scott said, can we pray together? I know no pain worse than someone praying that the most precious part of who I am would be cast out as sin. No, 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 no. And God said yes. Okay. Sure, I'd be happy to pray with you, I said. The candle was lit. We sat in the two chairs. I put on my armor, and Scott prayed. He prayed that God would bless the church that I served, that more and more people would attend, that the youth group would really catch that slight spark and grow. He prayed that God would bless my ministry and all of the ways that I make Christ evident in, in all of my leadership. He prayed for my household. He, prayed for me, for my wife Elaine, for our dog Toby, and I prayed for him. I prayed that God would bless his ministry, that God would continue to fill his preaching with such a sense of power, that God would take that little spark of overseas mission and fan that into a mission trip, that the various work of evangelism would continue in, in his church and in his community, that God would bless him and his wife and his two sons, the one making a decision about which college to attend. We said the Lord's Prayer together. We extinguished the candle and turned out the lights and stepped out, and he went down the hall to his room, and I took the elevator up to mine, but the floor seemed to have shifted. It was almost as if I had stepped out of that room from holy ground back to the hotel rug. <laughs> the next day was the very last day of that meeting, 
I saw Scott again, and I was so full of this amazing prayer we had shared, and, and I said to him, um, I said to him, hello, and he said, Cynthia, I look forward to seeing you again. I said, indeed, we'll be working again next year. He said, oh, that's not what I mean. I mean, I look forward to seeing you at the end. When the last trumpet calls, when the sun rises, when Christ comes again at the end, in that dawn of a new age, I look forward to standing beside you side by side, and together we will see the face of God. I said, Scott, I look forward to that day, too. I look forward to that day, too. I told that story back home at church, and there were folks who said, isn't that amazing how you can change people? No. You see, he went back to West Virginia and kept working on his understanding of homosexuality and sin, and I went back to Massachusetts and kept working on my idea of an open and affirming church. But friends, there was a moment, a moment of the kingdom of God greater than either one of us. And I hold hope that there will be a unity, a love, a perfection, and I'm okay that I can't see it now. But in those places of deep silence, in that moment of a hymn bubbling up in the middle of a prayer, in the opportunity here at First Parish to find friendships across all sorts of boundaries, there is hope for the kingdom of God. And you know what? That's enough for today. That's exactly all you need today.
In our time of prayer, I want to say a few things because I want you to pray for me. Um, and what I say, I hope, will only underscore the wonderful message we've just heard. And just as an aside, everything that's on social media isn't bad. <laughs> because what I want to share with you today came from social media. And it's a quote from literature, part of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Sam and Frodo talking to each other. Now Frodo, you may know, was on a quest to take a ring that was weighing him down but hanging around his neck to throw it in Mount Doom, the volcano, so that the evil one would be overwhelmed. Because if he got the ring, everybody would have been a slave forever. That's a synopsis. You have to read the books. <laughs> but it's Sam's wisdom. So they're getting near their goal, and Sam says to Frodo, I can't do this, Sam. Sam says, I know, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here. But we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come, and when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something even if you are too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back. Only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. What are we holding on to, Sam? That there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo and it's worth fighting for. So let us pray. I'll pray for you, you pray for me. That in this time of major transition in our church and in our country, that we'll hold on to the belief that there is some good here and in the world and that it's worth fighting for and that we'll be able to do it. Just as Cindy said, to love God with all our heart, to love our neighbor as ourself, and to love one another, because love turns darkness into light. So that's my prayer request. The ushers will come forward now, and we'll entertain the joys and concerns that you brought with you today. George? I have prayers. I'm asking for prayers for my son who has gone astray, that he may find the path again. Amen. Wesley. I'm asking for prayers for our friend Terry Gardner, who on Thursday was diagnosed with melanoma and she'll be facing surgery soon. Is for healing and comfort. George. Um, I would ask for prayers for my husband, Rick, who had some minor surgery, vein surgery. Um, and I would also like to ask for prayers for those who suffer from addiction and mental health. Thank you. You'd like to see him back on his feet again. Wesley. I want to congratulate North Parish Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Sanford, Maine. It has voted to become open and affirming after many years. 
I had the pleasure of serving that church for eight years, but I didn't get them to open up. <laughs> now they are. Good news. George. I have a prayer of thanks for this amazing place and the music this morning, which has brought me to tears a number of times. Um, I am so grateful and thankful to be a part of this community. Thank you, Sue. Cheryl. Hi, I have two prayers. One is for my brother-in-law, Bill, who's having a procedure on Tuesday to um, replace his, one of his valves in his heart. And the other is I had mentioned a baby, Cora, uh, a few weeks ago who is waiting for a liver transplant. Um, she is still waiting for a liver transplant, though there is a live donor who, and she has surgery scheduled for November 30th. Lou, what do we have from the web community? Carol Conley lives up the Walker family as Christopher went home to the Lord yesterday morning. And my nephew, Spencer, um, plays football for the Mount Desert Island High School uh, team. And I'm proud to say they made it to the state championship, which will be held next Saturday. So go Trojans. It's always good to have joys with our concerns. George. I wanted to hold up Brian Olson of our choir, who's not with us today. He's had a, a tricky week, and he told me yesterday that he is going for marrow biopsy tomorrow, and then also has an infusion session of three hours of infusions to deal with. So just hold up your prayers for Brian. Thank you. And let us pray. O oh God, we are here today because of one another and ultimately because of you. We don't really know what love is until your love reaches into our hearts and the flower blooms. We lift up all of these prayer requests today, some of joys, many of concerns. And we ask for your grace, your healing, your comfort, and your power. That you will continue to help people through us. That love, your kind of love, will turn darkness into light here and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
gracious Lord, we ask that you would bless the giving of these gifts, that they would be used to strengthen the ministry, that you would use our hearts, our minds, our voices, and our time in such a way to build the kingdom of God. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ and by the constant power of the Holy Spirit. go forth into the world, having sung praise to God who created this, this beautiful earth. Go forth into the world prepared to love your neighbor. Go forth into the world with the hope of the Holy Spirit, who shall give you every word and bit of wisdom that you need 
in the moment you need it. Go forth blessed and beloved.